Thanks for listening to this sermon from Spring Hill Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. So we're starting a new series. You can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, if you would like, with me. Uh, we're finally back into Acts. We took a little bit of a pause there as we preached through and spent some time in prayer for our 10 miracles. If you don't have one of those uh, brochures and would like to uh, just join us this year as we pray for God to move here in our church and our community, you can do that. Uh, but now we're getting ready to start our new series, Acts chapter 9, A Road to Remember. I, I thought A Road to Remember is just a fitting way to look at the book of Acts as you go through, or the book of uh, the, the chapter here, Acts chapter 9, thinking about what all happens here. I think Road to Remember is a good way to classify that. Two weeks ago, Nick and I, along with Tyler, went up to Jeff City for a conference. Uh, so we, I haven't been up to Jeff City in a while. I grew up really close to there. And so on the way home, as we were driving by, I said, hey, do you guys mind? I, I just live like 10 minutes off the road here. Could we just turn off of Highway 54? And so uh, I got to come over this hill. This is my, uh, the, the Proctor Homestead. Uh, that's the, my parents lived in that for about 38 years. And so from the time I was two until I got married, I was there. And then anytime we said we were going home, this is where it was. And when we topped the hill coming over Route A there, it was like nonstop for a half an hour. And I, I feel like I'm still young, but man, I, I turned into the old guy with like story after story. So, hey, slow down. I want to show you that tree right over there. We used to have a fort and that tree there that, you know, this is what we used to do. And that's the creek we used to swim in and blah, blah, blah. Like, so just story after story. It, do you guys ever do this? I don't know if this is just what happens maybe as you get older, but you kind of take a, a drive down memory lane and so you show up somewhere. So this is the road that I spent most of my life driving down that Route A and so every hill, that's my uncle's house and you can actually see kind of in the background some of my grandpa's land. He's actually, his house was over to the left there. But anyways, just story after story. So as we drove, I just, I, I kept wanting to tell Nick, slow down because I've got another story. You just have to hear this one. So I, I don't know if you have those type of stories. Surely you have trips down memory lane. Here's another one that I thought of uh, yesterday while I was playing on Google Earth was this next picture was uh, my first time at Spring Hill Baptist Church. It was in 2017. I had preached a revival in my hometown. And uh, af at that time, uh, Don had spoke with um, uh, Miss Wallace, Donna Wallace. And so uh, they had said, hey, would you turn your resume in? And so I drove past the church and went ahead and pulled in. I actually sat in the parking lot and called the church and Miss Belinda answered. So I talked to her for a little bit, but that's my, that my view right there from the road, coming down the road and being like, oh, so this is Spring Hill Baptist Church. Do, do you all remember your first time? If you got the church um, kind of newsletter, I think Lindsay Wallace said that she was born and raised here, so she doesn't remember her first time coming to this church. But I think for most of us, you could say, I remember the first time maybe came in from the west or came in from the east and pulled into the church and said, let's, let's try this church out, right? Now, if you could imagine these trips down memory lane, there's different roads that we drive on, never stop, never think about it. But there are also those roads that whenever we go down it, you've got a story, right? You're like, man, I remember that's where I got a speeding ticket was right there next to, you know, that cop was a jerk. Most of them are very nice, but only two bad cops that I know, Blaine's the second one, right? So uh, I was just joking, brother. Uh, there you are right there, man. Great to see you. Uh, so anyways, just those different trips down memory lane. So here's the next picture. If you could imagine what it would be like being with the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, Man, you talk about a trip down memory lane, that part of the world hasn't, you know, geographically, it hasn't really changed a lot. That path is probably uh, very similar to the path that Paul actually traveled on. You can see there that it's paved in the picture, but every time he tells the story, he tells it three times in Scripture, here in Acts chapter 9, then again in chapter 22, and then finally in 26, and every time he gives some more details. But if you could just imagine being like in the vehicle with him or being on the road with him and him saying, man, I, wait, I just got to tell you about this about this road. This is a road to remember. So when we talk about Acts chapter 9, I think a road to remember is a good fitting title for this because here's what you'll see. There is the road to Damascus, and then the very next story is a street called Straight. It's a straight street, right? And that's where he's going to meet Ananias. And then after that, the following week, so here's kind of what the sermon series is, is this is a road to remember Damascus. Then next week is a straight street, a street called Straight, which is Ananias. The next one is the road to, do you hear that voice squeak? Next one is, don't make fun of me. I've got a microphone, I'll make fun of you. 
Uh, man, what a squeaky voice there. Uh, the next one will be uh, the road to ministry. It says immediately he began to preach. And then I thought it would be fitting to have a, a sermon that talks about the dirt road. Did you ever go down the old dirt roads and you have to slow down because there's so many potholes and so many bumps? And that's for us the dirt road called fellowship. Imagine being the guy who kills Christians his first Sunday, right? His first day coming to the gathering. That had to be a rocky road. And then we're going to talk about the unmarked road, which is Paul's missing three years between whenever he leaves uh, Jerusalem and runs off to Tarsus, and then Barnabas goes and gets him. What happens to Paul during those three years? And then the last one we want to do is uh, the on-road to the gospel, and that is how Paul tells his testimony. And we want to take a Sunday to talk about how could you share your testimony and be a church that's prepared to do that. So that's where we're headed. If you're ready, uh, you're in Acts chapter 9. Would you stand in honor? Of reading God's Word. We're in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Acts chapter 9, verse 1, but Saul, still breathing out threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, if you have King James, it's going to add a little bit there about why do you kick against the goads. Uh, If you have a a more modern translation, jumping on now to verse 6, it says, But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who are traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man, Ananias, coming in and laying his hands on him, that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his, eye, fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask today, in the name of Jesus, that you would allow us to hear your words. Father, would you allow us to properly digest this text? Father, would you allow us to receive from it what you would have us receive? Father, I ask that you'd be with my mind, that you'd allow it to be clear And Father, would you be with my words that they too would be clear, that I would accurately um, proclaim the gospel today. Father, as your scripture says, um, if the trumpeter doesn't make a clear call, who would get ready for battle? Father, would you allow today's message to be clear, and would you speak to hearts? For each person here, Father, I ask that you'd speak to them. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, thinking about this road, it's really, uh, for Paul, this is going to be a road where his entire life changed. I mean, if there's one location for Saul that he's going to go back and say, that is the place where everything, every detail of my life turned 180 degrees. So a couple things that happen on this road. First is, it's a road between two priests. So think about this for just a moment. the, The passage begins that he goes to the high priest and he asks for a letter. Now, this is something to pause on because this is the highest authority that the Jewish people have. At this moment in history, they have no king, and so the high priest is the highest authority. And Saul knows this guy. 
And so Saul goes to him and says, why don't you send me on? I've already been persecuting those that belong to the way here in Jerusalem, but why don't you send me on with a letter uh, to those who are in Damascus? And so he's going to take this from uh, the high priest and, and just imagine what this would be like in our per- current context. This would be like getting a letter from the president or, you know, for maybe a Catholic, it would be like getting a letter from the Pope. Like you're carrying this document that is from the highest authority that you know of and you're on your way to Damascus. Now, there is an ancient document in the Catholic scriptures, it's uh, in the Catholic Bible, it's the, in Maccabees, and there's actually kind of a, a similar uh, letter to this. So there in the Apocrypha, 1 Maccabees 15, it says, if any scoundrels has fled to you from their country, hand them over to this high priest Simon that they may be punished according to the law. And so there's kind of documentation of things like this happening before where they would send a letter to say, these people ran from Jerusalem, and so we want them back, right? So that's what Paul is doing. He's got a letter from the high priest. He's on his way to Damascus, and guess who he meets on the way there? The true high priest, right? It says he sees Jesus, and you think in Hebrews it says this is the true high priest. This goes all the way back to the prophecy there out of Psalms where it says that he's going to make for us uh, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and so that's Psalms 110 verse 4, and that's Jesus. Jesus now appears, so here's Saul who just went to the earthly high priest that has orders to kind of bound up the Christians, and then he actually meets the true high priest, the one who uh, ministers on our behalf before the Lord in the true heavenly temple. So one is in the earthly temple that's just a shadow, one's in the heavenly temple, and that's who he meets. You think about how life-changing this is because for Paul, he operated under this total authority. At one point, he had the, the highest authority of mankind to say, I'm going to arrest Christians. And in a moment, it changes that he now has the highest authority from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's going to operate under this authority to say, the Lord has called me. His personality is so interesting in that, that Paul doesn't seem to ever be intimidated, that he really travels with this mindset of, I've got orders from the King of Kings, from the true high priest. There in Hebrews 7, it goes into great detail about how he's high priest. In Hebrews 4, verse 14, it says, this high priest who passed through the heavens, let us hold fast, then therefore let us hold fast our confession and approach the throne of grace with confidence. He has now met the true high priest. You also think, so there's a a change on this road for him between the earthly high priest and the heavenly high priest, but there's also a change on this road between his missions. If you have The ESV is what I was reading from there, and I know this is a little bit of a wordplay, but there's two ways that are represented there. First, there in verse 2, it says, uh, if he found anyone who belonged to the way. And then it continues to say, then as he went on his way. Now, I know that's just a wordplay. Those are two totally different words. But just thinking about this distinction, that there are those who belong to the way, and there are those who belong to their own way. Does that make sense? And so Paul really, when he leaves, he's traveling on his own way. He's got the way that he operates, his mindset, what he thinks ministry is, and then there are those who belong to the way. This is the original name for Christians. We would say now that, for example, if you were to look at world statistics of religion and you would say, here's how many people belong to Christianity. The original way that that would have been identified would be to say, these are the people who belong to the way. Now, let me ask you just for uh, a moment of reflection, why is this the earliest name, the way? Just to pause for a second and say, why is that what an early Christian would be called, the way? Well, because Jesus is the way, right? John 14, 6. Anyone else? Jesus, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone else? What comes to your mind? Why would it be called the way? Anyone else want to speak out loud? If not, won't pause too long here. A couple of things that come to mind. One is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says there is a wide way and a narrow way, and those one leads to destruction, one leads to life. That could be another reason. In Luke 9, 23, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so the thought there was, and really maybe we ought to move back towards this a little bit, that if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you have to follow. You, you should be doing something, which really eliminates people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And you would say, well, then how are you following Jesus? And they would say, well, I'm not. Well, you see, that's, that's not a possibility. That's a kind of intellectual 
uh, you know, anomaly. You, you can't do that. You can't say, I follow Jesus. I just don't actually follow the way. So there are those who belong to the way, and then there's Paul who's traveling in his own way. So think about what Paul's life looks like at this point. He had his religious way. I mean, he knew that if he was obedient, the Lord would bless him. He was, he in fact went on to say he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had an understanding of the religious system. These people are wrong and they deserve to die. The people who belong to the way should die, but Paul had his way of doing religion. So there was what his religion was. Then there was also his kind of personal achievement, his, his desire to advance in Judaism. There was his selfish ambition that he could have as a young man had already kind of advanced in the ranks. And then you also see in Paul's way, there's a great deal of persecution. Verse 11 says that, uh, of chapter 22 says that he, when Paul's retelling it, he said that he would punish them often in synagogues, and he tried to make them blaspheme. And he was in a raging fury against them. He said, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. The picture there is that he's like a wild animal. He was, if you go back to chapter 8, it says that Saul was ravaging the church. And the picture there is that it's, it's like a wolf that is tearing apart a sheep. It's not just eating it, it's trying to tear it to pieces. And so Paul's way, if you compare the way, which would be to follow Christ and to follow his teachings, to even love your enemy, and then there's Paul's way who say, no, no, if somebody disagrees with you, your goal is to tear them to pieces, right? You're going to ravage them. This is what he is. He's like an animal. This is why, if you continue on, we said earlier in King James, it says, isn't it hard for you to kick against the goads? And he actually says that a little bit later on uh, whenever he shares it there in chapter 26 about kicking against the goads. The thought there is for, it's a picture like of a cattle prod, if you've ever done any cattle work. And sometimes that cat, that calf or that cow will push back and they don't realize they're actually hurting themselves by pushing back. That farmer or that farmhand is, is trying to move them along. And so what Paul is doing is thinking that he could push back harder against the conviction. I wrote this down. Often when you see somebody who's got a very hard heart, it's because they're under deep and painful conviction. It, it seemed like whenever we used to go witnessing at Mardi Gras, the person who was the most upset was the believer who was in sin. I mean, really, of all the people we would talk to who would throw beer and cuss and do whatever else, it was always that person that you'd say, man, you are like crazy upset right now. Have you thought about why that might be? And it was often because they were under deep conviction. I wonder if this is a little bit of Saul, that he's being convicted, and instead of like being repentant, he pushes even harder against it. He kicks against the goads. And so uh, you're, you're just thinking about what's changing about him. His mission in life is suddenly changed. It says he sees this bright light, and the analogy that I thought of there is if you've ever been driving down the road, and now they've got these LED uh, high beam lights. If that's you, we love you, but turn those things down. I mean, it is blinding, isn't it? Somebody comes over with the LED, and they leave them on, on, and you just think, try not to hit the ditch. You're just like totally uh, glossed over, right? Imagine the glossing over that happens in Saul's life lasts for three days, and we've all seen this before. If you stare at a light for a second and then close your eyes, you can still see that image kind of burned into your mind. For three days, the image that's burned into Saul's mind is that of Jesus. And you've got to understand, his whole mission has just been turned over. His mission of we're going to destroy those who belong to the way, we're going to get them to submit. He says that he was even trying to get them to blaspheme, right? He, he would kill these people. He would arrest these people. His whole mission just got turned over, his whole purpose. So for three days, if you could imagine just that blinding image in his eyes, thinking about what he had done. If you listen to his testimony in chapter 26, verse 14, it says this, when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying, to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand up to your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. His whole mission here is, is about to change. To appoint you as a servant and as a witness for the things which you have seen in me and those which, uh, which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may be turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
You think his mission just changed. He doesn't share this detail. It's interesting in Luke uh, chapter 9, Luke is writing what happens there. But when you fast forward to chapter 22 and 26, it's actually Paul saying what's, ha- he's, what's happened there. So there's some more details there. But so in the actual conversion experience, there's a calling as well. In our day and age, we might have somebody who would say, I know that I'm saved, but I don't know what my calling is. And I would just ask you, is that possible? And I don't want to go too deep into that, but for Paul, his salvation and conversion and his call to ministry ran right together. He knew that as soon as he was saved, he immediately began to proclaim the word, right? And so if you're the person who's like, I'm not sure about my calling, I would ask you maybe to consider, maybe they run together, that if you are saved, you are also called to proclaim. Now, what avenue that is, I'm not sure, but this is why Peter goes on to say that you should make your calling and your election sure. Both of these. Are you sure you're saved, and are you sure that you've been called to proclaim the gospel, at least in some way? So I hope I'm not taking too much liberty there, but imagine now, Saul, how much of a change this is. I mean, his whole way of looking at the character of God has changed that he is gracious. Remember this there in 26, that he wants him to go and preach that they would receive the forgiveness of sins. This is Saul who's saying, no, no, the sinner we stone. And Jesus is saying, no, the sinner, we tell them about grace. And we hope that they repent. Isn't this amazing? His whole mission, his mindset has to be just totally toppled. So it's a road between two priests, the earthly high priest and the heavenly high priest, and it's a road between two missions, his mission to arrest those in the church and his mission now to proclaim freedom in Christ, to be a servant as opposed to being an authoritarian. And then the last thing that we would say is that it's a road between two men. Now, I think a lot of people get confused on the change of Saul's name to Paul, and really, if you look into that, it's really just the Jewish name and a Gentile name, because you see that Jesus here calls him Saul. If you go to chapter 13, the Holy Spirit calls him Saul. And so we're not saying that his name was changed. It wasn't that Saul became Paul. It really is Saul and Paul totally became a different person. So I like what Spurgeon said about it. He said, Paul was a great man, and I have no doubt that on the way to Damascus, he rode a very high horse. If you could just imagine him being so kind of pompous in, I'm Paul, or I'm Saul, I'm, I have authority from the high priest, I'm friends with the high priest, and I have authority here. I've got a document that shows that I'm a powerful man. And then Spurgeon went on to say, it only took a few seconds to totally alter that man. How soon God brought him down to his knees. Think about what changes with him, all the things that happened. He went from somebody who denied the resurrection to instantly believing in it. To say, no, no, there there is no risen Christ. To say, oh, Lord, who is it? Who is this? It's it's Jesus who you're persecuting. And he responds by saying, oh, Lord. He goes from being the persecutor to the preacher. And it's immediate. Immediately he begins to reason, right? He went from having a hard heart to having a soft heart. He, He goes from knowing what he's going to do. He goes from being this angry bull, one author said, to being the docile lamb. What would you have me do? He goes from being the leader of the group to having to be led by the group. He goes from having um, his uh, physical eyes open to having his physical eyes closed. And he goes from having his spiritual eyes closed to having his spiritual eyes open. It's a total transition. He goes from being this uh, understanding what the religious motions are to actually praying for the first time. Remember what Psalm 66 says? It says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have heard my prayer. You think this is really the first time that Paul begins to genuinely fast and genuinely pray, knowing the true character of God and who Christ is, now being able to approach the throne of grace with confidence, as we said before. Charles Spurgeon said this, that prayer is the autograph of the Holy Ghost upon somebody's renewed heart. So you see that now he's not just going through religious motions, but for the first time, he's calling upon the name of the Lord. One of the greatest changes that happen is that he goes from being an enemy of God to an instrument of God. Now, I, I want to pause here for a second because there would be a lot of people who would say, I don't think I'm an enemy of God. But you understand there's only two classifications. You're either an enemy of God or an instrument of God. 
there's no like, well, I, I'm neutral, right? I, there's no, nobody saying, I, I didn't want to join. Remember like America, we didn't jump into World War II. We said, we just, that's between you guys over there in Europe. There's no stance like that in Christianity. There's no stance like that before God. You're either an enemy of God or you're an instrument of God. And so for Paul on this trip, he makes that change from being an enemy persecuting Jesus To there in verse 15, uh, whenever this is to Ananias, the Lord says to Ananias, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. You either advance the gospel or you oppose the gospel. Wiersbe said, this is one of the best changes, is that he went from arresting those that were a part of the way to being himself arrested. And Paul talks about this in Philippians. So here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained this or that I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. The, the picture there is that Christ grabbed him. Now remember the whole reason why Paul is going to Damascus? Because he has orders to do what? To bind up those who belong to the way. And what Paul later on says is that it was at this moment, it was on this road, this is the road where I remember that Jesus arrested me. He took a hold of me. What, what a great transition this is. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Stroop and his ministry here in Springfield called Freeway Ministries, but uh, they, they do a really great ministry, especially to those who have been kind of drawn into drug addiction and, and uh, some different things like that. In 2020, they did this, uh, they did a Save Our City revival. And they had a video that was between uh, this guy named Paul Choate Paul Choate was uh, kind of a gangbanger in North Springfield, and then there was an officer whose name was uh, Mark Deeds, Officer Mark Deeds, and Mark Deeds said his, the person he arrested more than anyone else was Paul Choate, and then Paul Choate got saved, and if you ever, if you, I would recommend, follow uh, Freeway Ministries on Facebook, they always, they'll constantly be sharing kind of these before and after pictures, There'll be somebody who's like addicted to drugs maybe, and then they'll have a picture of them three or four years later after they've kind of gotten saved, got their life cleaned up. And it's a wonderful transformation picture. I would tell you one of the greatest transformations that you would ever see would be Saul on this road to Damascus. Man, by the time he leaves Jerusalem, he's filled with pride. He's going to arrest the Christians. By the time he gets to Damascus, he's a humbled man saying, I'm a servant of the Lord. It's a total, a total radical life change, isn't it? Can you imagine if you were on that road with him that he would say, man, I, if there was ever a place to slow the car down and say, let me tell you about what happened here. This would be it for Paul, wasn't it? He'd say, man, my whole trajectory of my life changed at this moment. Here's the point of today's sermon that I want to ask you. Do you have a road like that? that do you have a road where you'd say, man, that's where everything changed? If you could kind of take that drive down memory lane and say, this is, this is where it all changed for me. Now, if we looked at Saul's story, it, it's a little bit intriguing because there are some elements that, that maybe we would say are missing. It doesn't seem like there was anyone who preached the gospel to him. He had a personal experience with Jesus. That alone is very odd, right? We know that faith comes from the hearing of the word. So, but he has a vision of the Lord. And he doesn't walk an aisle like we might do today. There was no one who maybe led him in a prayer. And then there's even a little bit of uh, oddness in the fact that Ananias lays his hands on him and he receives the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, you, uh, you might even wonder, when was he saved? Because the wording really kind of sounds like, be baptized so that you could be saved. I think a better translation would be, be baptized because you're saved. But there's a lot of things that just have a little bit of a mystery there, right? Right? in what actually happens with Saul. But ultimately, what Saul could tell you is, even if all, a lot of the details might look a little odd, what I think all in all Saul would say is his final statement about that road between Jerusalem and Damascus is this, that's where I met Jesus. And, it, and so I guess what I'm asking you is, is there a place, is there a time that you would say, that's the road that I remember. That's when I met Jesus. I'm not asking when you got baptized, although I would love to hear that story and celebrate that with you. If, if there was a time you walked the, uh, down to the altar and talked to the pastor, I, that's a great thing. I don't have anything against that. Maybe that would be you today. But ultimately, my question for you is this. Did you meet Jesus? Because if you meet Jesus, 
He radically changes people. And so if you were to take that trip down memory lane, would you say that's, there's been a time where that changed? It changed who was the authority in my life. I mean, we all have some sense of authority, some, some sense of what, how we're operating our life. And for Saul, it changed that day from being religion to the king of kings. And we all have some type of mission, some reason why we're living, what we're living for. And for Saul, that day, it changed. It changed everything about him. That's my question is, if you were to take that kind of drive in your mind, when was it that you encountered Jesus? So for our invitation, it's two parts. One, have you met Jesus? And then number two, maybe you need to take a little bit of time today to remember that. Whenever I drove down um, that road, Route A, with Tyler and Nick, it was, there was a little bit of emotion with it. Like I remembered my parents sold that house while, uh, and they, they moved out of it. We didn't get to help them move because Titus was being born at an emergency C-section. So they actually drove the U-Haul to the hospital. How great is that, right? Like they were coming there when we were calling them. So I didn't ever kind of get to have the last walk through the house, right, whenever my parents sold it. So when we drove past it, I haven't driven by it in a couple of years. And so it was, there was like some nostalgia there of, man, I miss that place. I remember what that was like. I remember the tree house that, uh, or kind of like a little tree fort area that my sister and I had and fishing in the creek and just story after story. And there was a little bit of me missing that. I would ask you, number one, for our invitation, have you seen Christ and did he change you? But secondly, if you're a believer, um, church, the churches in uh, the book of Revelation, they, they get these letters and... Um, To the church in Ephesus, he says, I hold this against you, you've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen, repent and do the things that you did at first. So the invitation is two part. One, have you met Christ in a way that changed you? And then secondly, if you're a believer, how's your love doing? Maybe you need to take a moment to say, man, I remember what that was like when I first met him. I remember that love and I'm not there right now and I need to be. And I'd encourage you today to see him afresh, to look at him again, and ask him to rekindle the love that you need to have for him. What changed Saul? It wasn't his religion. It wasn't his study. It wasn't a program that somebody had designed for him. He simply saw Jesus. Father, we love you, and we ask that today that you'd speak to our hearts. Father, for those who are here that are not saved, who don't know you. Father, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. Father, I pray that you would reveal yourself through your word. And today as your word is preached, Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would convict them and that you would draw them to genuine faith. Father, for those who are saved, Father, I I ask that you would fan into flame a hunger for you a desire for you, and to know you personally and intimately. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. Would you speak to our hearts now? Would you give us courage to respond? Father, for those parts of our life that are still not changed, that we still struggle with, Father, would your your spirit continue to sanctify us and make us more like Christ? Lord, we we ask all of this for your good and for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Spring Hill Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. 